We have a new Office of Indigenous Strategy that is being formed in this uh, current year, and that's going to be uh, ideally centrally coordinating a lot of the Indigenous initiatives across campus. Previously, I worked in a recruitment and outreach out of the first, first People's House, which is the hub of student activities, but uh, in terms of other um, level of initiatives, uh, it's now going to be housed under the Office of Indigenous Strategy. So uh, who are the target audience for the Office of Indigenous Strategy? Well, uh, people who are interested in uh, advancing indigenous knowledge, um, access to indigenous education, so people who are in uh, school board functions and communities, government representatives, um, you know, other associations that might have an interest to, to see um, how we're uh, helping their communities to create um, learning opportunities. Um, we, we welcome that uh, level of interaction. So the First People's House is a dedicated indigenous student space on campus. Um, we have a 10 room uh, brownstone building, uh, really ideally located in the center of campus. And um, it's a residence, we have seven rooms there, so it's a, a residence for indigenous students, whether they're undergraduate or graduate. And it's also uh, the office of the administrative people of the First People's House. So uh, they're looking after the indigenous learners who are on the Miguel campus. Um, so students who are in undergraduate programs and, and graduate programs, uh, it's, a, it's part of the student services and uh, it's really a community uh, space. So it's a home away from home, and uh, you know, we have students uh, in the full range of ages uh, coming from across North America. So it's a, it's a really good uh, place to network and to meet other students. We have special events there throughout the year. It's the place where a lot of students are getting, given support, um, given opportunities to network, uh, to build their uh, career paths, um, and uh, wel it's a welcoming place for any indigenous learners, whether they're youngsters coming to visit the university or uh, their grandparents um, or learners of all ages, really. Um, it's a, it's a drop-in center, it's a resource center, and um, it's the, the, so, you know, the anchor. We have actually three dedicated indigenous student spaces on campus, so that's the hub. We also have the School of Social Work, uh, Indigenous Access McGill, which is another support office. And in the Faculty of Education, uh, there's a, a student workspace. So a, a large room for students who are in programs uh, that are part of the Office of First Nations and in Inuit Education. So we have three spaces on campus and we try to make sure the students are, you know, uh, their needs are met across our space. I think what makes McGill uh, pretty unique is uh, the Initiatives we've undertook in the last couple of years, our provost uh, launched a task force to look at indigenous studies and indigenous education. So it was a pan-university introspection on what, in, what are we doing for indigenous people, indigenous knowledge, indigenous uh, uh, professors and teaching staff, knowledge holders. Uh, let's make a better way to collaborate in a respectful way. And so I think, um, you know, what takes, uh, what, what it takes to get to that point is the capacity to listen to elders, uh, to the knowledge holders, um, to the community leaders, and also to the students, right, who are coming from the community. So we've, you know, we've, uh, our administration has opened up the, a, a serious channel to really get uh, input and feedback on the directions we're going and how we're growing the university in terms of our, our, our indigenous people as students as staff, as faculty, and also bringing in more indigenous content to curricula and also uh, different indigenous ways of knowing um, that can be uh, transmitted on campus or on the land. Uh, we're really trying to uh, make uh, as many open pathways as uh, possible for a respectful transmission of indigenous knowledge that can uh, really inform anybody coming through McGill programs we have a very international student uh, uh, body and, of course, other Canadians who are here. Uh, just really brings a lot of uh, opportunities for the university to grow as well. So um, we're happy to be on this, uh, this uh, really fun wave and we're growing. It's a really good uh, point for the momentum we have for Indigenous initiatives here.
the way we look at ourselves um, from year to year is examining our data. So our student numbers, which have been on the rise for the last few years, um, our incoming uh, teaching staff, uh, which also has been on the rise for the last few years. Uh, our provost actually set a target of having 10 indigenous tenure track professors by 2020. So, you know, we're really uh, heading towards that mark. Um, and the, the creation of this uh, office at the provost level um, and uh, ability to really collaborate across the university uh, is uh, one example of McGill uh, pulling that together. We're currently fundraising with our university advancement team to uh, be able to fund indigenous student scholarships and bursaries. Um, and that's one of the biggest barriers that uh, our indigenous students who are applicants and even admitted um, have to actually coming to McGill is that there's not enough of a financial package. But we're, 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 we, we have dedicated a few people to really work towards that uh, realization. Um, that itself will be uh, removing a barrier. So we have an indigenous admissions protocol that can be applied to undergraduate applicants, to most bachelor programs. Uh, so our enrollment services admits uh, applicants to most uh, of the faculties at McGill, but there are a few that have their own admissions offices, such as medicine and law. So uh, that gives a bit of flexibility for um, the admissions decisions committee to review beyond just a, an R score or an average, uh, depending on where the applicant is coming from. Uh, if, the, if the applicant is in the range, right, uh, where they're slightly, they're at the threshold or they're slightly below the, the cutoff used from the last year, um, this opportunity exists for them to be able to tell their story in their own words. So they can present additional documents, uh, a personal statement, letters of recommendation, uh, to really talk about their, uh, app, you know, their ability and their interests and their motivation to a particular program. And... Uh, in some cases, we, we have a lot of mature applicants as well. So, uh, of course, we welcome a uh, CV for anybody, any applicant who has got work experience who would like to have that also taken into consideration is welcome. We have programs in the School for Continuing Studies uh, that um, have some admissions uh, requirements, uh, prerequisites, but are, uh, as well, there are some that are open access just for anybody. But we do have a few robust programs uh, that are delivered online for indigenous people in the communities that are more remote and northern. Uh, so um, we have some examples of uh, entrepreneurship and information systems. Uh, so it leads to certification. So it's a 10 credit uh, course that can, that's delivered uh, usually uh, one time a week in the evenings. It's meant to be for working adults, so it's meant to be accessible. It's in their communities. So there are a few ways you know, for indigenous people to access the university, whether it's through School of Continuing Studies programs or bachelor programs. Of course, uh, master's level and doctoral programs, um, you know, the, they usually want to know uh, a lot more to begin with anyway, so it's not just the grades. But uh, we're certainly uh, working through a protocol on how we can uh, consider the uh, additional documents for uh, applicants into master's and, and doctoral programs. So we have a long-standing initiative since 2006 um, that's known as the Eagle Spirit High Performance Camp. And that was an event uh, held over the May long weekend uh, where we invited up to 30 uh, indigenous youth from around Canada uh, between the ages of 13 and 17. And it's an opportunity for them to experience campus and meet other indigenous youth. And so we give them an opportunity to usually explore the health professions We've worked with other faculties and, uh, and schools in the past. We always bring an athletic component to it as well. So we expose them to um, you know, physical activity. So it's not just sitting in a classroom or a, a laboratory the whole day. We take a run up uh, Mount Royal. Um, sometimes we do yoga. Sometimes we've done like inner tube water polo. Uh, we try to give them uh, experiences they wouldn't normally have otherwise. We did capoeira once. You know, uh, we usually have a lacrosse and basketball workshop. Those are sort of uh, the main, main sports that are in indigenous communities around here anyway. And uh, so that's growing into a bigger initiative that's going to be moved into July, starting this year, uh, into a week format. And there's going to be a, a lot of emphasis on the math and the sciences so that students have an opportunity to really get um, uh, a, a support around learning these concepts and 
having a new approach to math and sciences, right? Because we would, we would like to inspire the youth to continue through school uh, and also move into post-secondary. So um, we're trying to be part of this big pipeline uh, through the Eagle Spirit uh, Science Futures is what the initiative is going to be called. So when I look at the word indigenous education, two things come to mind. First of all, um, how are we going to be educating our indigenous people, you know, uh, of which I'm part. Um, and the other question is, um, in terms of looking at ed indigenous education is, well, clearly uh, a lot of other people need to learn a lot more about us. So we also equally need to provide opportunities for non-Indigenous people at McGill, at least in our context, to learn, to really engage with topics, uh, to meet, meet present presenters, appreciate different types of art. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, too, it's sort of a balanced, uh, two-sided um, unity that I see with Indigenous education. So my vision for McGill, at least in the next 10 years, um, is to really have a critical mass of indigenous people here. Um, our provost has a, a, a goal of a thousand indigenous students in the fall of 2022 who are here both uh, incoming and returning. So, you know, that's a, that's a big jump in our numbers, which I would love to see. Um, we're trying to make it happen. We have two recruiters who are uh, hired uh, to go uh, do the outreach into the communities across North America. And we're, we're actively working to create these scholarships and the student bursaries. And we're uh, planning for uh, an um, uh, enhancement of our Indigenous student services. And uh, of course, um, we also have a goal of uh, 10 Indigenous tenure track professors by 2020. And I could imagine uh, in 10 years from now, I mean, why not 20, uh, 30, 40, 50? Um, we're actually looking into creating something uh, large at McGill um, that's around sort of indigenous studies. And so I think right now we can just really dream uh, as high as the sky. And uh, so I'm excited about what could emerge in the next 10 years, just based on the momentum we have just based on the visions that we're, we're making uh, and how we're plotting out our, our path, uh, we really would like to become a center of indigenous excellence, right? Um, so indigenous people from across the hemisphere, across the world can come, uh, have a place, a dedicated space on campus to meet and to exchange. Um, we would like to also have a, a dedicated ceremonial space for indigenous people to use on campus. Um, I would like to imagine that um, we have a lot more indigenous, uh, I would like to imagine we have a lot more, a lot more indigenous physical presence on campus, right? Um, so besides our Hoshalaga monument, um, we would like to be able to fly our flag on the arts building um, during key times of the year. We would like to see, um, uh, uh, indigenous theme uh, to a project that's uh, currently going on uh, to reimagine an area into a park. Um, so uh, I'd love to see some real indigenous uh, marks here, um, physically structures, um, some motifs. You know, some some ways to indicate that you are on indigenous territory. What do we need to achieve that vision, I believe, is some solid um, partnerships with indigenous communities. So we're not talking only about the, the band councils, but the indigenous people as well, right? Uh, we need to listen uh, to everybody to be sure that we're uh, adequately representing uh, the, the, the needs of the people, right? And, and how to represent the people on the campus in a respectful way, right? Our flag, for example, if we're going to create any other things, um, I think that's a huge resource. So we need a lot of uh, participation um, at a higher level uh, with indigenous communities locally and from around the province because you know we're a provincially funded institution and we really look at all of our indigenous stakeholders in the province, the francophone and anglophone alike, as um, our key stakeholders. So 
we need stronger relationships there. Um, we need a lot of partnerships with uh, governments as well, or, or private um, nonprofit institutions, right? So we need to constantly look externally to our, uh, our other schools in Canada and in the United States, and as well Australia and New Zealand, uh, to benchmark uh, what are people doing. It's really good to be able to cross-pollinate. I think what we need is uh, that network to be strengthened. Um, we've, we have a few exchanges uh, between us receiving people from Australia, New Zealand, and Canada, and vice versa in, in those countries. Um, we need to have a lot more channels opened up and, and a lot more opportunities to bring each other to each other's campuses, not only staff, but students, right? Um, and um, we as in the indigenous staff as well um, need to all plug into those networks and travel to those other places because it helps us get inspiration, right? We, can, we constantly are looking inward, but we also like to see what other best practices are out there, right? And make partnerships. Um, we're actually pursuing partnerships um, and we'd like to pursue partner, uh, a, a, a plenty, a plethora of indigenous partnerships across the ocean, right? Across the land. So um, that's, uh, that's going to help us to really amplify our commitment at the university. And in that regard, you know, I think it'll just help us to continue to grow. I think we, we're on a good growth spurt. Um, and we'll, we'll hopefully benefit from that. For non-indigenous people in the university community, um, one of the best things they can do is just engage with the opportunities they have on campus. Uh, we have an Indigenous Awareness Week. Um, I know my colleagues deliver workshops uh, in a lot of classes uh, throughout the year. Um, they also deliver uh, workshops to staff and, and faculty who request it. So there are uh, opportunities and I think the students should definitely take every possible opportunity to learn through any of those op uh, channels that they come across. We have a powwow, usually that gets a lot of people's interest sort of at the beginning of the school year and uh, that launches the Indigenous Awareness Week. The following week is the Indigenous Awareness Week and uh, we try to sustain this momentum for the duration of the academic year.